things are better, better left unknown. And I'll never find you here. Cause no one's ever, no one's ever home. Oh, what a widow, a peaceful spider. When the glass is clean, she's a sneaky hider. Don't you wish that your weekend was longer than just two days? Well, if so, then you're in luck. Because here on Rippin' Common Sense Radio, our weekend begins on Wednesday. Yes, you heard that right. Our weekend kicks off every Wednesday at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10 9 Central, with Dark Wolf's Den. Starring yours truly, Jerry the Dark Wolf. But that's where the fun has only just begun. Make sure you come back every Thursday through Sunday at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10, 9 Central for the Rippin' Rabbit Hole Live Show starring A.J. the Rippin' Rabbit. He dives into the archives of vocal legend Art Bell and brings those stories up to date. So make sure that you spend your extended weekends with the animals on radio. Jerry the Dark Wolf and A.J. the Rippin' Rabbit. Starting at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10, 9 Central, every Wednesday through Sunday, right here on Rippin' Common Sense Radio. Rippin' Rabbit Hole is a community-driven radio. At times, the community comments may reveal prejudices and other beliefs that we or our sponsors do not condone. Views or opinions expressed by the community, callers, or guests 
are those of the individual speaking and do not represent the views or opinions of this site. Rippin' Common Sense content is intended for mature audiences only. Enjoy. This is Cynthia Sue Larson with Reality Shifters and the International Mandela Effect Conference. And you're now listening to Dark Wolf's Den Show on Rippin' Common Sense Radio. Now the ultimate power in the universe. This is your man Meta, aka Propagate This Light, and you're now listening to Dark Wolf's Den. Are ghosts real? We had a thousand hours of continuous communication in the spirit world. Does time travel actually exist? The laws of physics seem to be compatible with time machines. You know, sometimes I wonder about reincarnation, don't you? A four-year-old boy in Adelaide, Australia, has told his parents that he used to be Britain's Princess Diana. What would happen if the world found out that aliens were real? I didn't say disclosure would be easy, but what is the alternative? To establish a space force as the sixth branch of the armed forces. We have so many questions and yet so little time, so to have you here, the pleasure is all mine. Coming to you from a secret mountain cave, hidden deep within the Idaho wilderness, this is the Dark Wolf's Den Show. Now, here is your host, Jerry Hicks. That's right, I am the Dark Wolf, and welcome back to another episode of the Dark Wolf's Den Show. Whether you're on the edge of reality, the edge of the galaxy, or the edge of your seat, we're glad you chose us to be right there with you. <laughs> tonight, ladies and gentlemen, is Spooktober 21st, 2020, and tonight we're going to start a mini-series on ghosts and ghostly activities. Those classic entities that we celebrate every year, well, there's so much about them that you just do not know. We're ghost hunting this week, ladies and gentlemen, 21st of Spooktober 2020 on the Dark Wolves Den Show. But first, here is Jerry Hicks with this week's Today in History. <laughs> Today in History. Thank you, Dark Wolf. And you are sounding great over there, my friend. I'm really looking forward to this ghost mini-series you've got planned for us. This is going to be some amazing information, I am sure. Ladies and gentlemen, today on this day in 1949, the author of Brave New World, author Aldous Huxley, wrote a letter to congratulate his friend George Orwell on his new novel, 1984. That's right. That was in 1949 he wrote the novel, 1984. And if it doesn't feel like we live in the middle of 1984 crossed with Brave New World, I don't know what does. Guys, that is today's... Today in History! And back to you, Dark Wolf. Let's hear about these ghosts. I'm really excited to hear what you got tonight, bud. Thank you, Jerry. Ladies and gentlemen, Jerry Hicks. He will be back later in the episode to tell his story about a childhood ghost that he had. Right, Jerry? You are coming back later in the episode, right? DW, I would be proud to come back later in the episode. I appreciate it, bud. Well, it is your show. (laughs) 
Uh, but tonight it is my show, and tonight we're talking about ghosts. That's right, but this is such a broad topic that we're going to talk about ghosts tonight. Then tomorrow night we'll be covering shadow entities. Next Wednesday we will be talking about demons. That's right. And then we will close out next Thursday with our Halloween party. I hope everybody enjoys this mini-series. And to get it started, ladies and gentlemen, you know, to uh, have a ghost, one would expect that there is a spirit, right? An entity. Usually we think ghosts are people that have lived on Earth already, right? So to determine that, we must determine what it is that is creating a haunting, right? Like, do we have a soul? There is the first question that we should start with. If it is a ghost, then that would be our soul released from our bodies, right? <laughs> the classic interpretation of a ghost, correct? <laughs> However... Let's find out if there is any evidence at all to suggest that we even have a soul. Or is this just another one of those superstitious ideas? For instance, can the soul be weighed? It only stands to reason that if it is a part of ourselves, our bodies, and it leaves our body when we die, then there would maybe be a weight to it, right? <laughs> Actually, there might. How many of you have heard of the 21 grams theory? Do we have a soul? And if so, is it measurable? On April 10th, 1901, an unusual experiment was conducted in Dorchester, Massachusetts. Dr. Duncan McDougall was going to prove that the human soul had mass and was therefore measurable. He conducted this experiment on six dying patients who were placed on specially made Fairbanks weight scales just prior to their deaths. The patients were selected based upon their imminent death. Two patients were suffering from tuberculosis. A total of five men and one woman were selected for this experiment. Dr. McDougall's intention was to weigh each body, before and after death, to determine if there were any differences noted on the precision scale. In the company of four other doctors, Dr. McDougall carefully measured the weight of his first patient prior to his death. I would like to point out that there were four doctors there. That means there was more than one independent verification of the data. Once the patient died, an interesting event occurred. McDougall explains. Suddenly, coincident with death, the beam end dropped with an audible stroke, hitting against the lower limiting bar and remaining there with no rebound. The loss was ascertained to be three-fourths of an ounce. Now, of course, we know that when the body dies, certain things are released, certain gases and other things like that. So what about the difference in weight between those things? What caused this weight loss? Everything was taken into account, from the air in the lungs to bodily fluids. It still could not be explained. So after everybody had run the numbers, everybody realized that there was three quarters of an ounce extra for some reason. But that is only just one case. What about the rest of the patients? The experiment continued on the next patient with the same results. As you guys know, Jerry and I are constantly complaining about these dogmatic scientists that will only accept evidence that can be repeated over and over. Well, how intriguing that this evidence seems to be being repeated over and over. Evidence of something that science does not want to admit exists at all. Dr. McDougall felt he was onto something extraordinary. According to Dr. McDougall, The instant life ceased, the opposite scale pan fell with a suddenness that was astonishing, as if something had been suddenly lifted from the body. Immediately, all the usual deductions were made for physical loss of weight, 
and it was discovered that there was still a full ounce of weight unaccounted for. Following the experiment and consulting with the other attending physicians, it was determined that the average weight loss of each person was three quarters of an ounce. Dr. McDougall concluded that the human soul weighed 21 grams. To reiterate this point, the rest of the experiment, the exact same results were discovered over and over. All five doctors took their own measurements and compared their results. Not all the patients lost the same weight, but they did lose something that could not be accounted for. Now, I find that very intriguing, too. Not all of the numbers were perfectly exact. However, they were close enough to say that there was something anomalous going on that could not be explained. And then something interesting occurred on the third patient. He maintained his same weight immediately upon death. It was only after a minute had passed that he finally lost an ounce of weight. Dr. McDougall explained this discrepancy as follows. I believe that in this case, that of a phlegmatic man, slow of thought and action, that the soul remained suspended in the body after death, during the minute that elapsed before its freedom. There is no other way of accounting for it, and it is what might be expected to happen in a man of the subject's temperament. Now the intriguing part here is that it took longer for this soul to release itself than the rest of them. However, given the personality of the man that it belonged to, it actually makes sense in this particular case according to the doctor anyway. Dr. McDougall conducted the same experiment on 15 dogs. The experiment showed no change in weight following their death. McDougall concluded that this may signify only humans have souls. Which is something that I heavily disagree with, but that's for another show. H. Lav Twining, a physics teacher at Los Angeles Polytechnic High School, attempted the same experiment on mice in 1917. His conclusion was aligned with that of Dr. McDougall. There was no deviation in weight when the mice died. Which, once again, I also disagree with, but just disagreeing with it doesn't make it any less true, does it? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, yet also mentioned a moment ago, the freedom when the soul was released. And I had a friend named Robert Browning, who is a very uh, strong paranormal investigator. And he was talking about his theory is that like the soul is locked into the body somehow. And when we die, the locks come off and we are free to roam in our true form. And this is of course just one theory, but it could explain ghosts, could it not? So once these locks are off and these 21 grams are released, the soul itself is released into the ether, if you will. What happens then? As a matter of fact, it's been my experience going over case files for so many years that there's a number of types of hauntings, and it can be broken down into two main categories, and that is interactive hauntings and non-interactive hauntings. These can actually be broken down even further, which we will hear about shortly. But first, let's just discuss the two general categories. An interactive haunting is your classic haunting. And we'll come back to that in just a minute. But one that's really intriguing to me is the non-interactive hauntings. Something called the stone tape theory also known as a residual haunting. Hey weirdos, I'm Grant. What classifies as a residual haunting? We'll find out right now. And that voice you hear, of course, is Grant Wilson, 
also known as one of the paranormal investigative teams of Ghost Adventures. And say what you like about the TV show, like it or hate it, Grant himself is a very well-known, very well-established paranormal field researcher, and he has done a lot of research into what types of hauntings actually occur. And again, the residual haunting is one of my favorites, as we'll get into shortly, because it's different than the rest of the types of hauntings. A residual haunting is essentially any haunting that repeats itself over and over and over and over again. The event itself doesn't have to be tragic or even sad. Sometimes the sheer repetition of an event can cause an impression. The concept was proposed as the stone tape theory in 1961 by archaeologist slash parapsychologist T.C. Lethbridge, and even earlier by philosopher H.H. H. Price as place memories in 1940. The prevailing theory is that the energy of a particular event has become trapped in the surrounding material, and that energy is released when the conditions are right. Much like a cassette tape. Remember those kids with the pencil in it and you rewind it? You Thus given the name the stone tape theory, as if the stone itself records what's going on around it, which is possible, perhaps the stone of the earth itself, but it also reminds me of the Bible, right? In the Bible, multiple times, God says his blood cried up to me from the ground, and I always just kind of thought that was symbolic. But if you look at the stone tape theory, if the blood crying up from the ground is the essence of the human, perhaps it could be that very thing, the soul, or the event in time, I should say, trapped because of the spilling of the blood. That is only, of course, a theory. There could be so much more reason. Perhaps it's the energetic, emotional energy. There's a lot of things that it could be, but it is intriguing that even the Bible speaks of such types of things. Okay, so maybe more like a Blu-ray. Better? The information on a Blu-ray is there on the disc, but you can't access it unless it's in an appropriate device. That device is powered on and someone has hit play. In other words, the conditions are right. The same goes with the residual haunting. The problem is, no one quite knows what the right conditions are. But we can say, more often than not, residual hauntings happen in places with high limestone, iron, or quartz deposits. And for those who may not know, iron and quartz are found within the body, that's right. Quartz is found within the brain of the body. And iron is found usually within the blood of the person. As a matter of fact, iron is one of the most important elements to humans. As we found out in the vampire episode, and too much iron can actually be damaging to humans. Once again, what we found out in the vampires episode, right? So it's intriguing that these elements would be uh, persistently across the case files as being part of the stone tape theory. A residual haunting is easy to identify because the activity, be it frequent or not, will be repetitive. It'll just do the same thing every time, no matter who's there or what's in the way. The most famous of these hauntings are usually battlegrounds, that's right, like Fort Donaldson Battleground in Tennessee, where I've had many case reports given to me from people who have visited this battlefield, as well as Gettysburg. I spoke with a gentleman the other day that was telling me of the hauntings of Gettysburg once again, and how he caught some evidence on tape while he was at Gettysburg himself. <laughs> on the battlefields of Gettysburg, we've caught full-scale residual EVPs. Guns being fired, cannons being fired, horses running around, bugles, orders being yelled. It's fascinating. 
But again, it's not like those people are living that battle over and over and over and over again. There's no intelligence there. It's just repeating energy. And these things are very interesting because like it says before, these things are repeated over and over. The soldiers marching onto the battlefield for war, the battle itself playing out over and over, the commanders shouting the uh, commands to the soldiers, everything playing out over and over like it did with the original time that it happened in history. And once again, battlegrounds are the most famous of these, but we've also got like the lady that will walk through the house the same hallway every night at the same time, right? Or these different timed hauntings that seem to have no interaction with reality. Just repeat over and over and over again. In fact, the whole concept of a ghost walking through walls stems from the fact that a ghost is walking through a doorway that has since been covered up. The entity will continue to follow that path even though there is no longer a door there. This definitely explains why a lot of entities do seem to walk right through a wall, right? It makes a lot more sense that to them, the wall wasn't there in their time. But also, you gotta consider, right, that through years, things are built up over. So does that have an effect on the ghostly haunting? Even the concept of a ghost floating is due to residual hauntings. It's a ghost walking up a flight of stairs that is no longer there. A residual haunting does not interact with its environment at all. Nothing will ever move. You may hear a door open and close, or an object move, but it doesn't actually move. So what would happen if the original time that the incident occurred that creates the residual haunting? That the ground was many feet lower at the time, right? What would happen then? Would the ghost just go on up to the top level of the ground? There was a case where a family's small children were terrified because these entities kept walking around their house. The problem was they weren't seeing the whole person. The children were seeing the entities from the waist up sticking out of the floor. That can be pretty terrifying. But come to find out, the answer was simple. The house was built on the foundation of an old farmhouse. The old foundation was significantly lower than their current floor. So the entities were simply walking on the old floor. And only half of them were showing up through the new floor. This is actually an incredibly intriguing piece of evidence, believe it or not. Cause think about this, that means the spirit is relegated only to whatever soil level they were at at the time that the haunting was created. You could literally bury this kind of haunting and never see it again if you wanted to because it would be repeating underneath the soil itself over over and over and over, which again brings me back to the original idea I spoke of a moment ago from the Bible, that the blood cries out to me from the ground, end quote. There go, the ground must have some type of uh, specific meaning in this, right? the ground level itself specifically being the level at which the spirit walks. Now because this is, in theory, trapped energy, there's no intelligence behind it. This can make for some pretty odd scenarios. For example, there was a case where a woman was being haunted by a residual haunting of herself as a child. Yes, someone who is alive can be haunted by themselves residually. What I find very intriguing about that is that one of our fellow Rippin' Rabbits that hangs out with us very, very often, quite often tells a story about how they ran into themselves in their own kitchen while going to make coffee. And of course, every time we discuss this incident, people usually end up on the multiple parallel dimension theory, right? However, if one can haunt themselves while still alive, if that impression can be left while one is still alive, then that impression can be replayed over and over without the person actually being dead. This is more of an impression in reality or an impression in physical objects opposed to the soul itself haunting anything. 
again, the stone tape theory that it is recorded in some type of the elements and played back over and over. So yes, this would allow a person who is still alive to leave a residual energetic trace behind that with the right conditions applied could repeat itself and replay over and over. And this could very well be what happened to our fellow Rippin' Rabbit friend who I'm not going to identify. If they would like to identify themselves, that is up to them. But just the same, it is intriguing that these hauntings even do exist of this type, right? But that's not the only haunting, oh no. That is actually a very small percentage of the hauntings. Then this is once again considered a unintelligent haunting. So how does that differ from an intelligent haunting? An intelligent haunting is essentially one where the entity interacts with its environment. So already different from the stone tape theory, because again the stone tape or residual haunting is just a replay over and over of an event, whereas these are intelligent uh, beings that can be interacted with your classic EVP ask a question get an answer type event would be a intelligent haunting. It in no way implies that the entity is actually smart. The widely accepted theory is that these are the spirits of humans who have passed on. This would be what we would classically explain a ghost to be. Like my grandmother haunts her old house, or some type of, of haunting like that. A person who is passed on to come back and walk or roam the earth for whatever reason. They're not the green toned skin, gaping mouth, oily hair, empty eye socket, things crawling across the ceilings that you see in movies. And of course, Hollywood has given us many different versions of ghosts and spirits over the years. But once again, they can be broken down into a series of simple categories as we're going through this evening. Leave it to Hollywood to make something much, much more hyped up than it really is. And mess with the truth of the situation. The people. Some examples of an intelligent haunting are seeing an entity that sees you too, or seeing an entity move an object, such as opening or closing a door. And we hear stories like this all the time, right? I had a person tell me that when they first moved into their house, they come into the kitchen, and all of a sudden all their cabinet doors had been opened wide. This is just to let the person know that the spirit is there usually. However, this would be definitely an interactive haunting. It can interact with the world around us. Getting an EVP that answers your question is technically an intelligent haunt. Sometimes an interaction can be extreme. There are many accounts of people who have had prolonged interaction with an entity, conversation, believing that it's a real person, only to find out later that it wasn't. Dustin being pushed in Ireland at Lep Castle is another example. I always tell investigators I'm training, you will get hit, punched, grabbed, slapped, pushed, scratched by things that aren't there. If you don't want that to happen, don't be a paranormal investigator. And that is something that a lot of people don't think about when they start doing paranormal investigation. Uh, Of course, they think they're just going to go out and ha-ha, talk to a spirit, whatever. However, that is rarely the case in field research. It turns out the spirits can be quite evil and mean in field research. And like Grant said, you will be punched, kicked, slapped, ripped, bit, the whole nine yards. Uh... But we've heard these stories quite often, like Bloody Mary, right? How you would end up with scratches, or a lot of these different uh, uh, paranormal haunting investigations. Uh, You hear about these ghosts scratching people, 
and you kind of just dismiss it, but it does show up over and over. So being a paranormal investigator isn't all unicorns and bells and EVPs. Oh no, it can be quite dangerous because uh, some of these spirits can very strongly interact with the world around them and us. Now that doesn't mean that being pushed or scratched or grabbed is a bad thing. Be careful not to assume intention. And I know some of you right now are going, wait a minute, if I get scratched, I'm going to assume it's a bad intention, right? However, as we're about to hear from Mr. Wilson, Mr. Wilson, <laughs> as we're about to hear from Mr. Grant, this necessarily is not the case because let's think about how we normally interact on a day-to-day -day basis with each other, right? If this is just a human without the locks on, if you will, as we spoke of earlier, a 21 grammed escaped soul, if you will, then if they are interacting like we would normally interact with each other because, let's be honest, we wouldn't know any other way, would we? then perhaps what we might see as being aggressive is merely an attempt to get our attention at all. For example, if I'm trying to get your attention from across the room, I'm going to shout your name. And if I don't get a reaction, what's next? I'm going to yell. This could come across as aggressive. So if an entity is across the room and I ask a question, and it sounds like it is yelling the answer meanly or aggressively. Perhaps it is because it is too far away, and it is merely trying to interact from the distance. If that doesn't work, what's next? Well, I'm going to approach you. That could come across as being aggressive as well, like I'm chasing you. So if you see a spirit form coming at you, it may not have the intent of chasing you at all. As a matter of fact, it may be doing nothing more than trying to communicate in the only way that it sees available to itself. And we must also consider that there may be a bit of a time delay between the spirit world and the real world, right? We may not be seeing everything in real time, or what looks like is speeding towards us may be moving much slower on their side of the veil, if you will, in their type of reality. This is all, of course, speculation indeed. If that doesn't work, I'm going to poke you. Hey, do you hear me? That too could be mistaken as aggressive. So if a spirit touches you, perhaps they've been screaming and trying to get your attention the whole time and finally found a way through a physical touch of some means. Once again, we cannot profess to understand how the spirit world works. We haven't had anyone come back yet and explain the rules of it. <laughs> like I'm poking you as an angry person. If that still doesn't work, I'm going to grab you or push you. Hey, 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 do you see me? And again, that could be misconstrued as aggressive. Remember, I had no intent other than to simply get your attention. In context, those actions don't make me evil or even bad. I was simply trying to get your attention. And this is why we should always have an open mind to ideas and must not close ourselves off from what may be the obvious answers at times. Because as we think we know the intent of something, oh, it's an evil ghost because it's dark colored or it followed me or whatever the case may be, it may not be evil or dark or bad at all. It may just only be trying to communicate. And let us remember also that communication is not always the easiest for people who haven't even left the earth yet, let alone trying to communicate from the other side. And also, if these are people that have left the earth, they would retain, at least in theory, their own personalities still, their conscious soul, if you will, which brings me personally to believe the consciousness and the soul are one and the exact same thing. 
Yeah, but that's still up for debate highly in philosophical circles. So dare not say that it is truth. It is only my opinion at this point. But again, with that said, there are many types of people in this world. And when they die, they are still the same type of person, right? Good or bad, right? That being said, most people are good. But some people are mean, dumb, stupid, or just plain annoying. The same goes for entities. So there are times to provoke, but you have to be prepared to clean up that mess. Remember, in theory, ghosts are people too. And under this category, there's actually yet another category of intelligent hauntings. Uh, this is called the inhuman haunting category. What is an inhuman haunting? It might not be what you think. Oh, do tell, Mr. Grant. Because as you see, this is my first experience with this type of category. I didn't have this category when I was doing ghost hunting and field research. So, inhuman hauntings. I'm gonna need you to open your minds up for this one, guys. Don't worry, Grant. Our audience has a very open mind set indeed. To put it simply, an inhuman haunting is any haunting caused by something that has never been human. It is these type of case files uh, that make me question what we heard earlier about animals not having a soul. I had case files like these before, I just didn't have this category of inhuman. So this category encapsulates a lot of extreme examples that overlap folklore and strong belief systems. Historically, what they are and where they came from is hotly debated and the fodder for arguments, fights, and even war. I don't want any of that here, so I'll try to keep it simple and not offend anyone. And we would very much appreciate that, Mr. Grant. Okay, strap in. Here we go. I'm going to start with positive entities. These are basically any non-human entity that provides overwhelmingly positive support. Not just the comforting feeling you get from having dead Uncle Fred's overwhelming personality around you again. It's not like someone handing you a plate of tater tots. We're talking about life-changing positivity here. And of course, when we think of a haunting, the last thing we think about is a positive interaction. Most of the time, most of us get scared and start to freak out or worry that something bad or wrong has happened, right? However, some hauntings actually, as we're going to find out, can be extremely overwhelmingly positive. Uh, In fact, some refer to these as angels. For some people, the word angel conjures up an image of a flaxen-haired being clothed in brilliant white robes with a halo of righteous light burning bright atop their crown and soft feathery wings spread triumphantly behind them. Oh, and don't forget the harp. Got it. The harp. Doesn't make any sense without the harp. The harp is where the beautiful music comes from, right, Grant? <laughs> but you're right. It is a very overwhelmingly positive uh, story or case file every time I've ever heard someone claim that they had an experience with an angel. And yes, this does have a lot of religious overtone, but as we go through this series, we're going to find in the next couple episodes uh, that angels and demons may be very real after all. While this image is beautiful and comforting, try to erase it from your head for a minute. Because in my experience, positive entities don't seem to belong to or subscribe to any particular religion. They can aid anyone from any belief system. Most positive entities are never actually seen, and in the few cases when they are, they seem to take on a much more subtle, even symbolic form. And we know that every religion across the world speaks of these positive type entities. Uh... And because most people are expecting that brilliant being, people can misinterpret a potential positive entity as something dark and even evil, when it's the positive entities that are actually exposing that darkness. I personally have never seen a positive entity that I know of. I have also never encountered any entity that I would consider an angel of any type. But I truly feel that at several points in my life, 
something overwhelmingly positive was present. And my response to it undeniably affected my life for the better. And I like to think it was more than just dead old Uncle Fred's spirit journey. Now I do know that I have had a protection on my life that is unexplainable by standard means. Uh, so perhaps we all have that guardian angel, that positive entity that watches out for and protects us as best it can. Although I know some of you are giving your guardian angels a run for their money out there. <laughs> so positive entities, what do we do about it? Well, nothing. I mean, I don't get people calling me complaining about an overwhelmingly positive presence in their home. I like to think that if you feel that you are being visited by a positive entity, that you're doing something right in your life, or you're about to face a decision to do something. And in the second half of the show, we'll get more into how to deal with these entities, uh, as well as different theories as to what may be really causing these events. Now, on the flip side of that are negative entities. Now, these are the opposite side of the spectrum. Essentially, a non-human entity that is extremely negative. Now, I'm not talking about someone stealing your plate of tater tots. While that is pretty heartless, I'm talking about truly evil and manipulative forces. Some people like to call them demons. And once again, we will dig deeper into the demons in our episode next Wednesday. But I don't like to use that term because the term itself is empowering to the negative entity. And empowering the negative entity is the last thing you want to do. I mean, come on. When I say demon, you immediately picture a massive dark form with some combination of horns and clothing hooves. Maybe even leathery bat wings. Basically the Balrog from Lord of the Rings. Yeah, that's pretty much what I picture when I picture a demon, yes. I don't want to face that thing in somebody's home. Using the term negative entity doesn't automatically conjure up the aforementioned image. An image that was built quite literally to put the fear of God in us in order to help keep us on the right path. And again, like positive entities, negative entities don't seem to belong to or subscribe to any particular religion. In my experience, the more you are afraid of these things, the more hold they seem to have over you. These are creatures that seem to feed on fear, and fear only seems to make them stronger and stronger. So, instead of picturing a huge lumbering horned demon that could pull even the greatest of wizards into darkness, I prefer to picture a short, wafer-thin point dexter with broken glasses whose butt I could kick all day if I needed to. Now, they can appear as just about anything, but you'll feel their influence more than you'll actually see them. The goal of a negative entity seems to be to wear down your will to the point where you allow it to take you over. This process follows a very predictable and reversible series of events I call the path of possession. And once again, we will dig deeper into this on next Wednesday's episode of the Dark Wolf's Den Show when we discuss demons at length. Now, before you start shaking in your proverbial boots, these things don't just jump out of a dumpster in an alley one day and now suddenly you're haunted by a demon. They're more like a lion chasing gazelle. They don't chase after the strong. They go for the weak and the sick. They aren't interested in the healthy ones. If you're living your life well, you're socially active, you're not obsessed or addicted to anything, basically not doing anything jail worthy, you'll most likely never encounter a negative entity. So what do we do about them? Well, you really need to know your stuff here. This is a completely different ballgame. Getting rid of the negative entity is actually the easy part. I think our friend, spiritual warrior and pastor Bill Bean would disagree with that statement because amongst his many titles, he is also an exorcist. And he has encountered many of these dark creatures, these demonic entities. And he has released many people from their possessions of these, or from these creatures of darkness and evil. It is not an easy feat the way I understand it, but like he had said, Getting rid of that is one thing, keeping it away is a whole different level. This is the fascinating thing about negative entities. Religious provocation of any kind 
works every time. And I stress any kind, be it Christian, Jewish, Muslim, Buddhist, shamans, you name it. I mean, in my experience, I've never had it fail. But it has to be a genuine belief system. In this moment that you call upon this higher power, regardless of your religious system, you automatically feel this empowerment toward positive and good. Like you have a protection, an intent of protection, if nothing else around you. And these really do tend to ward off dark entities. These positive energies, uh, or positive entities. But as we've heard already, we could be our own positive entities, our own haunting entities, right? So perhaps that is the case, that when you call upon these religious systems, uh, that you have that full belief in the positivity, and that positive energy runs away these dark creatures. Uh, and that belief system has to align with the homeowner's beliefs. Now, I don't think the power is as much in the ritual per se, as it could be in the fact that most people will never feel more empowered than when they believe that their God and all creation is on their side. Thank you, Grant. That is much better stated than the way I just tried to say it. Again, getting rid of the negative entity is the easy part. Keeping it away is the hard part. You don't ever destroy a negative entity, it seems. You just sort of push it away to buy the client time to turn their life around. Remember, this thing came around due to a problem with the client's lifestyle. You have to help the client to reform that lifestyle so that they're not appealing to this type of entity again. You have to make them a healthy gazelle again. Due to the sensitive nature of the client's lifestyle and what brought this about, a negative haunting should always be dealt with privately because a client can't really heal if the whole world knows about their problem. And of course, common sense would suggest that that would definitely be the case. One would need time to heal from this like any other traumatic event in one's life, right? Uh... Next we have elementals. And of course, elementals can be found among Native American folklore, as well as Irish and even Scottish folklore. And once again, I find it intriguing when you find these case files coming from many different cultures uh, with the exact same information. Uh, Elemental entities are not particularly good or bad. They come in a stunning array of shapes and sizes, but when seen are most commonly a three foot tall or shorter dark form. And when I hear this, I tend to think of the little people like the fairies and the gnomes and all these little creatures that are said to exist among those types of folklore. They go by many names, but the most common name would be fairies. Now, I know what you're thinking here. Bear with me. We're not talking about Tinkerbell. I personally have had significant exposure to this type of entity, much more than the average Joe. Many people would love to see them, but most people can't or don't. But it wasn't always this way. Exposure to elemental entities appears to have been much more common in past times, as seemingly every culture on the globe has mentioned them in their histories. And once again, I do find it incredibly intriguing when you have these multiple cultures that say the exact same thing. That's gotta be worth something. Elementals are inherently tough to talk about because of the social stigma we've attached to the term fairy. Any real knowledge we may have once had about them has been reduced to the stuff of children's stories. I mean, the term fairy tale itself is synonymous with a children's story. But as we learned last week, fairy tales weren't really meant for children at all, were they? Fairy tales are actually incredibly dark. And if you did not get to catch that episode, I would definitely suggest going back and listening to the dark fairy tales after this episode. Or the encounters were twisted and used as tools to scare children into behaving properly. This, combined with their irregular appearance and indifferent behavior, makes them hard to understand. 
further clouding our knowledge base on them and stigmatizing them as bad, evil, or even demonic. But in my experience, they tend to be concerned solely with their own endeavors. Sometimes we factor into their plans, but most times we don't. Usually, if they're interrupting your life, it's because they want your behavior to change for some reason that suits them. Again, not good or bad, just indifferent. So, instead of these being creatures that just exist alongside mankind, perhaps they are spirits of some type or creatures from the spirit realm, like fairies and gnomes and all these creatures of lore, these short creatures, the ones no longer or no taller than three feet and usually dark entities of some type. Imps, if you will, was another example. Perhaps these aren't exactly as uh, folklorish as we once thought they were. How many of you for Halloween dressed up as a ghost, right? Uh, or maybe you went for the darker demon entities for Halloween. <laughs> well, this Halloween, we've heard a lot about the craziness because of 2020, but contrary to popular belief, Halloween has not been cancelled, that's right. Here at the RippinRabbitHole.com, we are proud sponsors of OurTrickOrTreat.com. That is O-U-R-T-R-I-C-K-O-R. T-R-E-A-T dot com. Over there, you can find a virtual village to knock on doors and win many, many prizes from both national, state, and local sponsors. Again, the Rip and Rabbit Hole are proud sponsors of this program, and we have made sure that Halloween has not been cancelled. And you can even dress up in your ghost costume in your own house while knocking on the virtual doors. <laughs> in the second half, we're going to discuss different means by which to deal with these entities that we've discussed in the first half. And then we're going to hear from Jerry Hicks and his true ghost story about the house that he grew up in. And then we're going to discuss different theories of what may be causing these hauntings aside from the paranormal aspects. We're going to hear all sides of this topic, ladies and gentlemen. There's so much more to go. Also, remember to have your ghost stories ready because AJ will be doing an Art Bell classic. He'll be doing Ghost to Ghost on Halloween night here on the Rippin' Common Sense Radio. We are really looking forward to that. So if you have a ghost story that you think of while listening to this episode, uh, definitely make sure that you call in for the Ghost to Ghost on Halloween. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we've got to take a network break right here, and we'll be back with so much more of the Dark Wolf's Den show in the second half right after these messages. Don't you touch that dial. Oh, yeah. We gotta stoke the fires and run off the men in black. Don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. Sex in the city? Nope. Interview with a vampire. Nope. If you build it, they will come? Uh-uh. Febreze to wheeze in the middle? Wrong again. Depends. Nope. Welcome to the Twilight Zone, my friends. A phenomenon known as the Mandela Effect. You may have heard of it. You may want to not neglect unbecoming, awake spiritually inclined so sit back relax while i blow your mind take the thumb off the cell stop following the sheep down the rabbit hole we go are you ready for that leap the Sapruder film hashtag jfk i looked at the footage and i said what the heck 
How come there are six people in that dang car? Stretch limo for me, this was all too bizarre. A glass behind the driver, no way, Jose. I remember four in the car, my mind was in total disarray. Trying to make sense of what I was seeing, what I was witnessing, didn't connect with my inner being. A second woman in the car for me was only the first lady. Do you smell what the rock is cooking? All this seemed kind of shady. Berenstein Bears. Nope. Shazam? Sinbad? Not in this reality. Good lord. An awakening. Was it all a revelation? The naysayers and skeptics call it confabulation. They say you just remembered and call it back. Crazy, did you smoke a doom? Maybe that's why it's a little bit hazy. Uh uh, unless you experience it, you'll never know. But enough of that, on with this Mandela effect flow. Mandela effect in the house. What did the world happen to Ed McMahon? In this reality, Publishers Clearinghouse was not a fan. Never the spokesperson, but we remember it clear as day. McMahon holding that check while the winner yelled out, Yay! American Family Publishers. Never heard of them until now. This Mandela effect has me raising the people's eyebrow. So many theories on what it could be. Have you ever heard of CERN and the LHC? Luke, I am your father. Nope. Sally Fields? Nope. Wrong again. That stands for the Large Hadron Collider. I thought it would mention. You know, the machine that opens up portals into different dimensions? You're probably thinking that this is all science fiction, but you gotta think outside the box and have no restrictions. Alternate realities and parallel dimensions. Okay, I get some of your apprehensions. Could this all be a spiritual evolution? Because the human race has grown tired of this toxic pollution. Mandela effect in the house. crazy. Some people, they just don't understand. That's, that's just the way it is. You know? Stay strong, my friends. That's just the way it is. Dolly has no braces? Are you serious? Good boy. Joel Olstein. Oh, wait, Joel Olstein. So what the heck happened to the owl? Oh my gosh. Oh, this, this is definitely the Twilight Zone. This, this is crazy. Are you enjoying the program so far? I know I am. Good evening, everyone. It's AJ, the Rippin' Rabbit. If you're enjoying tonight's look at Jerry Hicks and the Dark Wolf Sten show as he howls at ghosts and you haven't done so already, please make sure to thumb up that video, hit that subscribe button, and ring that bell. You'll get our notifications every time we go live. We're here every Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday nights, bringing you the very best in common sense radio, the Rip and Rabbit Hole. Now, Jerry will return tomorrow night with part two as he deals with ghosts and shadow people. Kicks off tomorrow night starting at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10, 9 Central, Thursday, October 22nd. Then I return Friday, October 23rd for a daring look at Halloween costumes. <laughs> it's going to actually be a fun night as we explore some of the greatest Halloween costumes ever. If you've done one in the past few years that you have a photo of, I would love to see it and include it in Friday night's show. Send it to me at rippinrabbithole at gmail.com. That's R-I-P-O-N-R-A-B-B-I-T-H-O-L-E at gmail.com. Show me your past Halloween costumes. I've got a few up my sleeve, and we're going to look at some of the hottest trends for 2020. It's going to be a fun night as Spooktober dives down the rabbit hole of Halloween costumes Friday night. Then Saturday, join me as we dive through the rabbit hole of seances. It's Halloween. It's Spooktober. We have to talk about seances, and I'm going to tell you, Saturday night, we're going to do the first on-air seance ever. It's going to be fun. A live on-air experiment as we try to make contact with the other side. So join me 
Saturday night, October 23rd, starting at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10, 9 Central for seances. Then Sunday, we'll end out the weekend right together discussing our fear of dolls. Yeah, that's right. An audience-suggested topic for Spooktober. As we did the Fear of Clowns episode, so many people said, how about one on the fear of dolls? You asked for it, you've got it. Get ready as we explore the rabbit hole and the spooky dolls that exist within it. That's a look at the weekend ahead. Make no mistake about it. Spooktober continues right here at the very best of Common Sense Radio, the Rippin' Rabbit Hole. Stick around. Jerry Hicks and the Dark Wolf's Den Show continues as he howls at ghosts. So take a deep breath and let it out and realize that your weekend has just begun. <laughs> Stick around. A lot more to come. Are you ready for the ultimate Halloween experience? <laughs> this year, with all the social distancing taking place, Halloween, contrary to popular belief, has not been canceled. I repeat, Halloween has not been canceled. <laughs> The Rippin' Rabbit Hole is proud to sponsor a unique virtual Halloween event taking place October 15th through the 31st exclusively at ourtrickortreat.com. That's O-U-R, trick or treat dot com. Sign up and knock on virtual doors for 17 days straight to win a variety of prizes from national state, and local sponsors. Check out rtrickortreat.com for the ultimate Halloween experience this year. If you were meant to be controlled, you would have come with a remote, but you didn't. And that's why you listen to the Dark Wolf's Den Show. Now, here is your host, Jerry Hicks. That's right, I am Dark Wolf, and welcome back to the second half of the Dark Wolf's Den Show. <laughs> Whether you're on the edge of reality, the edge of the galaxy, or the edge of your seat, we're glad you chose us to be right there with you. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight we're talking about ghosts. In the first half, we covered the many different types of hauntings. And in the second half, we're going to talk about different ways to deal with these different types of hauntings. Uh, the first one we discussed was called the stone tape theory, or a residual haunting. Now that we know what it is, how do we deal with such a type of haunting? Well, because residual haunting is essentially a movie being played out, there's no intelligence behind it. You can't interact with it. You can't reason with it. Blessings won't work. Religious provocation won't work. Well, what the heck do we do? Well, first off, the good news is, it's just a movie. And it is just like a movie replaying in reality over and over. It won't hurt you. It won't talk with you. It won't try to date you. It won't steal your tater tots. That's good, right? Basically, there's no threat to you. The bad part is because you can't reason with it, you can't convince it to move along. What you need to do is you need to locate the material the energy is trapped in and remove it from the premises. But how do you know what material is holding that energy? Well, usually you'll get a clue as to what the material is based on the haunting itself. For example, if the haunting is of dead Uncle Fred incessantly riding his unicycle back and forth, chances are the energy is trapped in that unicycle you inherited from dear old Uncle Fred. That's all you inherited. A lot of times we will hear stories of people picking up entities all of a sudden and not having any idea why all of a sudden they're having these residual hauntings of these types. And a lot of times they will have just bought a new piece of furniture of some type. A lot of times these entities end up getting trapped within this furniture, within these items. And this residual haunting can occur. Whatever the material may be, remove it from the premises for at least a month. If the activity stops, 
Hooray! If the activity continues, you chose poorly. Oops, thanks for playing. Try again. But be careful here. Sometimes the material is part of the house itself. We had a client that was sort of obsessed with trying to remove a residual haunting, and he nearly dismantled his entire house. That's ridiculous, since there's no threat to you. And as we spoke of before, perhaps the blood in the soil itself could have something to do with it. It might not necessarily be something that's top level at all. If for some reason you simply cannot find the material that energy is trapped in, you'll have to learn to live with it. You know, just grab some popcorn and enjoy the show. And once again, these really require no action because there is no threat to the human. These would just be a movie replaying over and over, and unless it's an annoyance to you, it would actually be of no worry or threat at all, so there would be no real reason to really deal with it. The next one that we discussed in the first half was called an intelligent haunting, and this was a category that even had the subcategory of non-human entities. But the first category we're going to cover, of course, is the general haunting, your classic general ghost haunting and intelligent haunting. How do we deal with those? Well, thankfully the entities are intelligent to some degree, so therefore they can be reasoned with to some degree. This has worked time and time again, but you have to be firm and united as a family. As odd as it sounds, get together often and talk to the empty air. Be clear about what you want these entities to do. The only time I've seen this strategy not work is because of the homeowner. Usually there was one homeowner that secretly wanted it to stay or do something different than the rest of the family. And it just doesn't work in that scenario. So it would seem that the intent when dealing with these entities uh, once again has an effect on the outcome. It comes back down, it sounds like, to energy. You can even make detailed arrangements. For example, there was a case in Connecticut where half of the year the husband was away from home working. When he was away, the entity was taking care of the wife. He would let her know when someone was approaching the house, open doors for her, and give a general sense of comfort. But when he returned, it did not make him feel comfortable. It would close doors on him. It would push him off of things. It would stand and watch him in bed to the point where he was uncomfortable and had to sleep on the couch. And he had no idea what to do. The fact that this entity was very selective in who they liked and who they did not is very telling in the fact that there is an intelligence behind this. So there was an interesting situation here. When he was gone, his wife felt very safe and comforted. But when he was home, he couldn't be the man of his own house. So we talked to him and explained the strategy, and he came up with a deal. He told the entity, look, when I'm gone, you be here, you watch over my wife, you take care of her. But when I come back, you need to go away. Otherwise, we're going to have you go away completely. Immediately, there was a response from the entity that next year, it did it perfectly. And this case, of course, had a happy ending. But not all cases in that particular way. So a lot of people mistake intelligent hauntings for something darker. One of the reasons that makes me believe that this is a dead human is that they seem to have free will. As noted once again by the previous case file, that they do seem to have, which is also something that we have in this world. Which, once again, leads me to believe that the consciousness and the soul are one in the same. The intent of the consciousness or the intent of the soul of the entity and its free will are still honored on both sides of the veil. Religious provocation simply doesn't work on them. I can't force an entity to leave using religious provocation any more than I could get a living person to leave a room. Which is clearly much different than the dark entities like the demons who run away from the religious provocations. If religious provocation worked, then that would fit into another category for another video. Now a blessing may help the homeowner feel better, but it will have no more effect on the entity than it would a living person. So if you've got an intelligent haunting in your home, stop, take a breath, leave the monsters at the movie, 
and approach these entities as the people they are. And I think that is the absolute best advice for a paranormal field researcher. Again, my friend Mr. Browning that I used to know used to also speak of this. And the fact that they are unlocked souls. They're still the same person that they were here in this world. They just does, don't have the physical form that we do still. And yet... They are able to speak with us. I've known one case where a racial slur was said and the ghost immediately reacted to such thing. It is horrible, but it is something that did occur. And it's these things that really lead us to believe that they are no more different than you and I. They just don't have the skin that we have. But they're still humans, still can be talked to, just like the rest of us are treated just like a living person and I have found in my experiences uh, that in these cases if you treat the entity like a regular human they tend to respond much much better and again under this category of intelligent hauntings uh, we also had the non-human hauntings. Uh, how do we deal with something like an elemental, right? So what do we do about elemental activity? Typically, the best advice with elementals is to wait them out. They will typically eventually give up, but in rare situations, they can take it to the extremes. Knowing when they're most likely to go to extremes is tricky. It needs to be taken very seriously. If ever you encounter an elemental, do make sure that you take the encounter extremely seriously indeed. Uh, another entity that needs to be taken seriously if encountered uh, would be the poltergeist. Uh, but it's not quite what we've been told by Hollywood uh, as a poltergeist would be thought of. Uh, Traditionally, poltergeist comes from the German words meaning noisy spirit. You may be familiar with the movie Poltergeist, where people get sucked into TVs or eaten by trees, and you go to the light, or no, 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 you run away from the light. None of that really tells us what a poltergeist is. I use the term poltergeist to define any haunting that is caused by a living human being. Yeah, I know it's weird, but that's why you came here, right? Here are a few examples. And this gets in to the theories side of what could be causing some of these hauntings, and we will continue to dig into the theories as we go along. I've had several cases where people were being visited by the ghost of someone who was still alive. How is this possible? Sometimes the person was alive and well with absolutely nothing wrong in their lives. This is an event also called bilocation. And Cynthia Sue Larson speaks of this quite often. I myself was witness to a case of this at the first Mandela Effect conference. That's right. Somebody that was in their room the entire day also ended up having a conversation with a lady and her son outside of her room in a totally different part of the building at the same time that she was in her room. And even further, the events in which she was daydreaming, in quote, or thinking heavily upon, are the exact same topics that they discussed, supposedly, in the bilocation event, which was verified by the witness that swore that they talked to the other person. So this is a real thing. I have actually seen events, like I said, of bilocation or living haunting, or as uh, Grant puts it here, poltergeist activity, though that's not how I would have defined a poltergeist prior to this episode, I got to say. And sometimes they were in a traumatic event, such as an accident, or an abusive situation, or about to pass away. In each and every situation, though, the living person had no idea they just sent a ghost to the client. And this case at the conference was no different. The only way that we found out at all was one of the people went up 
to the person who was in their room the whole day, explaining how wonderful it was to talk to them earlier in the day, at which point they realized something was very wrong. There was nobody else in the hotel that looked like this said person. Equally, the topics of conversation were identically matched to the topics of thought that was going on in that person's head that did the bilocation without them even being aware that it occurred at all. That being said, other people have supposedly intentionally left their body to visit another person or place via out-of-body experiences or astral projection. And as we get deeper into this series of episodes, astral projection will come up quite a bit more. But usually in this situation, the person being visited has no knowledge that they've been visited at all. Some people even claim to be able to leave their body and visit spirits in the spirit realm to help them on their own turf, so to speak. If I could enter the spirit realm and visit entities on their turf, now that would be awesome. And yes, this too reminds me of that movie Insidious, where the father went into the astral realm to help the ghosts and retrieve his child that had got lost in the astral plane, right? <laughs> so maybe that was based more on reality than it really was based on sci-fi. <laughs> The next type is much more common. Whenever I ask a female client when she had the most intense paranormal activity in her life. Now this is very interesting. To all the females in my audience, listen to this. You might find this quite intriguing indeed. It's almost always between the ages of 9 and 13. Why is that? Well, there are countless cases of prepubescent girls or menopausal women creating paranormal-like activity in their homes without even knowing they're doing it. They will subconsciously cause objects to move on their own. They become terrified not knowing that they are the ones causing the activity. Could prepubescent or menopausal women be having this effect on reality? Is there any evidence to back this up aside from anecdotal case files? Unbelievable, right? Go girl power. But there is some science behind it. I'm sorry, what? Did you say there's actual science behind this? There is some science behind it. And what kind of scientific evidence are we talking about, Grant? We once measured the brain activity of a menopausal woman uh, who was in this situation. And right before any object moved in her home, there was a spike in brain activity. In fact, there's been articles written on this in several science magazines. That's right. You heard that right. There are scientific articles on ghosts and hauntings in science magazines. Now, these are hauntings, once again, that are claimed to be created by the living and not necessarily haunting at all, but more of telekinetic experiences or moving objects with one's own energy. That's weird, right? It's about to get weirder. I love it when someone says it's about to get weirder. Grant, you have my attention. What do you got, my friend? Ever heard of a tulpa? A tulpa is supposedly an entity that is created entirely in your mind. It's not just another thought process. It supposedly has its own free will, its own emotions, its own memories. Basically, another sentient being living independently inside your own mind. And we're only going to touch on this here as we will get much, much deeper into tulpas tomorrow when we discuss shadow entities. Now this is separate from multiple personality disorder because you do not assume this other personality. It's funny that he should mention multiple personality disorder because Jerry and I have accused of having multiple personality disorder before. Uh, what do you guys think? <laughs> it is independent of your own. Some people claim that they've even been able to hallucinate this thing into existence only for them, not for other people. It sounds like it could be sinister, but most of the time, in fact almost all the time, it's not. It's all in how you decide to create it. 
God, this is weird. And once again, we will touch on this tomorrow night when we go into shadow entities. Maybe it's easier to wrap your head around this if you think of an imaginary friend. A topa could be one explanation for an imaginary friend. Topas are usually intentionally created, but sometimes they're not. And those people might think they're schizophrenic, psychic, or even possessed. On the flip side, they can be very therapeutic for people who are often alone, or people who have been through traumatic experiences that no one else seems to understand. Now these are claims from other people. I personally don't have a tulpa, nor have I ever created one. I don't think there's enough room in here for one. At least not that you know of, Grant. Uh, perhaps you did have a imaginary ch uh, friend as a child. Uh, I know I did. And then there are thought forms. Thought forms are a little odd but they're not hard to grasp. Imagine creating a small, temporary entity in your mind, assigning it a task, and sending it on its way. Now where a topo was supposedly a completely separate, independent entity, a thought form is more like a mental robot that you can program to do certain things for you. I, I don't know, it's... Stay with me. Now, usually people generate a positive, healing, loving thought form, and they send it to people in need. Now, supposedly, you can make negative ones, too, but they don't work as well. And yes, I know some of you were thinking, oh goodness, we're talking about New Age stuff now. However, that may not be the case at all. These thought forms, at least the negative ones, may actually be known by another name, too. Now, before you think I'm nuts, some people refer to these negative ones as curses. And of course, all of these Spooktober episodes, we've heard about these curses, right? From vampires to werewolves, and now in the ghosts, we keep hearing about these curses. And perhaps there is a whole, whole lot more to these curses than we give credit to. That's definitely a topic that we'll have to cover sometime very, very soon. But again, these entities not still somehow seem to exist. Uh, and these thought form entities, uh, this is really intriguing that we can send these thoughts out because don't we do that anyway? If we look at science, we are constantly emitting an electrobiochemical signal into our environment for others to pick up on, which I do believe is very easily done. So these thought forms going out and affecting reality is actually not as far-fetched and new agey as it sounds on the surface. Maybe that helps you wrap your brain around it? So tell us, Grant, how would we deal with these type of entities? In the case of a poltergeist, a solution usually comes in the form of education, comfort, and patience. Because of the seemingly random behavior, poltergeists are inherently hard to understand. Therefore, people almost always jump to them being evil or demonic. Again, religious provocation will not work in these situations because they're being caused by free will creatures. Humans. Helping people wrap their head around what is really going on is key. Finding the source and understanding that source is integral to moving past a poltergeist. And now that we've discussed the different types of entities uh, and hauntings that exist, and you know, guys, we've only scratched the surface of ghosts. There's so much more to cover. We may even have to do another episode just on EVPs and spirit boxes, because we aren't even going to have time to get to that this evening. Uh, it will definitely go on the list of topics. But there are many theories as to what could be causing these haunting effects. Perhaps there's actually a real world reason, aside from the paranormal, that may be causing it. Some theorists suggest that this may very well be the case. But there is evidence that infrasounds cause more than just headaches. Some researchers think it might be responsible for that creepy haunted house feeling. 
One paper published in the Journal of the Society for Psychical Research suggests that a standing sound wave of specifically 18.9 hertz is responsible for some of the spooky happenings in their lab. And you remember we have talked about ELF waves before and infrasound and super low frequency waves uh, and how these frequencies can have an effect on humans and the different ways that we think and the emotions that we feel and pretty much everything about us can be controlled through frequency. And these frequencies, uh, if low enough and consistent enough, can cause disruptions and things that seem like hauntings, right? Well, that could very well be the case. And it could also, if that is the case, be weaponized very easily, couldn't it? Uh, Researchers at Coventry University kept seeing moving things out of the corners of their eyes. Their hair kept standing on end. They felt simply dreadful any time they were in the lab. At this point, a lot of people would argue that there is a negative entity of some type in the lab, right? Uh, or some type of entity, right? Well, it turns out that wasn't the case this time. But one day, they noticed a piece of equipment was vibrating without an apparent cause and discovered that an extractor fan was creating a standing wave at, you guess it, 18.9 hertz. When they turned off the fan, one of the authors described the feeling as if a huge weight was lifted. There have been a lot of cases of industrial fans or large fans like that causing these extremely low frequency waves that would affect people and make them feel like they're having a haunting incident. And researchers have tested this idea on a larger audience, literally. British scientists played music to a large auditorium filled with people and slipped infrasound into some of their songs. Some people in the audience said they felt uneasy or sorrowful, getting chills down the spine or nervous feelings of revulsion or fear when the songs contain infrasound. Spooky, right? Now, it's science. And it makes you wonder how much infrasound is used at times in the songs that we hear to engage a reaction from us of some type. Uh, I've always wondered how many times artists slip things like that into songs uh, because subliminals are illegal, but different frequency types, those aren't quite as illegal. And it makes you wonder if they slip these also into the TV episodes uh, and get our emotions worked up over things uh, like in the news, right? Get us really scared over stuff while playing playing an infrasound track through the TV. I'm not saying that's what happens. I'm saying it is a good possibility, though. <laughs> However, that being a scientific explanation, there may actually be evidence to suggest in the case files that this explanation doesn't quite hold up. There is another explanation, though, one that my Mandela Effect friends might very much enjoy the con concept of. A temporal anomaly refers to the theory that two different time periods can overlap, causing a bleed through of one time period over the other and vice versa. And this has been reported quite a bit in what we call glitch in the matrix stories, right? Essentially, experiencing another person in their time period as they experience you in yours. I've often wondered if ghosts aren't really living people in yet another time period. And this theory would suggest that, that is very much the case, or even in another dimension, right? For example, when we investigated the Mount Washington Hotel, we captured two separate minute and a half long EVPs of a woman from the early 1900s, acting like she could hear us in her time. She was saying such things like, of course I can hear you, where are you, and I do not find this amusing. Could it have been that this 1900s lady was having tea when all of a sudden disembodied voices started talking to her? 
could that have been what would have been a haunting to this lady and a haunting to the team on this end of the time stream? She even ended the conversation by saying she was going to get security and then she left the room. It was as if we were the ghosts haunting her. She could have just been an intelligent human haunting or she could have been alive and well living her life hearing these disembodied voices thinking we were ghosts haunting her. Once again, this does make some assumptions because we do not know what the spirit world is like. Perhaps it is an exact replica of this world. Perhaps it is this world just without the physical skin anymore. That we don't know. But if that is the case, then perhaps that this 1900s lady was a ghost for a very long time and was just able to interact with the team. Again, this is all theory and speculation. If that were the case, then neither one of us are actually ghosts haunting anyone. We were just two different time periods somehow bleeding into one another. And as we know, we don't truly have a grasp on how time as a characteristic actually works. Yes, the argument can be made that we made the measurement of time, but it still moves forward. It is still a characteristic of the universe itself. But once again, we don't really know how time actually works. Perhaps it's just as cyclical as everything else in the universe. And perhaps these cycles can overlap and cause what we would call a haunting. I can't say for sure, but it's fun to think about, right? I'd love to find out if she kept a journal. And if she did, did she write about this strange occurrence? If so, that would be some amazing evidence. That would not only be physical evidence, but it would bring into question a lot of what we already know about the paranormal itself. Now it may even be possible for you to haunt yourself this way. I find it so incredibly intriguing that with all the time that I've searched and researched paranormal and especially ghost activity, I've never heard so many times of the idea of you haunting yourself, yet it has come up no less than three times in this episode. I find it incredibly intriguing a thought. Matter of fact, perhaps most hauntings are just us cyclically in time haunting ourselves. Uh, huh, that is definitely something that Jerry and I have got to ponder on. Bear with me. We did this one case with a new investigator, a trainee. Three of us headed over to investigate the guest bedroom. As we approached the doorway to the bedroom, all three of us saw a shadowy figure on the far side of the room between the bed and the wall. Now, the trainee, upon seeing this, freaked out a little bit and went downstairs very rapidly. Now, the other investigator and myself were able to head over to the entity, where I was able to pass my arm through it back and forth. Uh, it felt a little cold and like there was a slight static charge. After I passed my arm back and forth through this entity, it then darted around the edge of the bed, past us, and out the room. Several weeks later, we were back at the location with the same trainee, and I encouraged her to be strong and go back up to the bedroom. Shortly after being up there, she came running down the stairs and told me an interesting story. She said that when she was in the bedroom between the bed and the far wall, that she saw three shadowy figures approach the doorway. One of them rapidly moved away back into the hall. Then the other two came into the bedroom and one of them passed its arm through. Now, this freaked her out so much that she ran around the edge of the bed, out the room, and downstairs. And this case would definitely be a wonderful piece of evidence for the idea that time itself becomes cyclical, and that one may very well be able to haunt one's self after all. Now, stop. Do the math. In both instances, the same events transpire. Did an unknown ghost come up and pass its arm through her? Or was it me from the past coming up and putting my arm through her 
in the present. Crazy, right? It actually happens more than you might think. Everyone I know who has been investigating long enough and intensely enough has at least one story like this. Now, it's all circumstantial, I know, but something odd is happening here. And as a good investigator, I have to try to understand it. And that I agree with 110%. As a good investigator, we must always strive to understand the phenomenon which we are researching. That is kind of the point of researching it, right? To try to find out in the end exactly what is the cause of the phenomenon. In this particular case, it seems like these case files over and over, once again showing this, is starting to show a phenomenon that even when I was researching the ghost phenomenon before, like I said a moment ago, I had never run across. But it's an intriguing idea that I would never have considered before. Now, if this theory is true, it raises some interesting questions. Such as, if this is actually caused by two different time periods overlapping, why do we only seem to experience people from the somewhat recent past? And why don't we experience people from the far distant future? You know, in their shiny metallic jumpsuits that all 50s movies demand that we're all destined to wear. Well, in the story I just related, I believe I saw someone from the future. But they appeared as a shadowy figure. There wasn't enough detail to know where in time it actually came from. And those two seemingly small pieces of evidence right there are huge when it comes to the idea of a time cyclingness. Like he's seen a recent future and she experienced a recent past. And what could cause these uh, particular repeats is interesting because it reminds me again of the stone tape theory and the repetitive movie that keeps playing over and over. It could be something that is locked in, like this cyclical event. A cyclical event that forever re for whatever reason got locked into that portion of reality. Now I can't explain that any further, but it's intriguing based on just that little bit of pieces of evidence that we've heard so far once again that may suggest something entirely different than what is a f originally assumed to be the ghost phenomenon. But sometimes you may get solid clues. You may see a figure in 50s clothing, or you may see a figure in modern day clothing, or you may pick up subtle cues in their speech. Either way, it seems that these temporal anomalies do not extend much more than 100 years in any given direction. So, chances are we would experience a temple overlap of someone from the year 2019 to the year 3018. Or even as far back as the year 1820, right? A hundred years in any direction, that is also once again new information to me. And it's another intriguing piece of information of the puzzle. It may also go a long way to explain other rabbit holes that we dig down into, once again like the Mandela Effect, if time is different and works differently than is originally suggested, then there may be a different explanation for the Mandela Effect and perhaps things can be changed in between these different cycles to create what we call effects. This, again, is just a theory that I'm running right off the top of my head. But given this information we found so far tonight with ghosts, a topic that we never thought would be related to the Mandela Effect, right? It's funny how these rabbit holes do get connected. Uh, Rather than the year 14486, that's the year humanity will actually embrace the 50s metallic jumpsuit. That being said, many people may actually experience a future temporal anomaly and not even know. Do some people confuse a temporal anomaly with an alien encounter? Oh look, we find ourselves at the corner of yet another unexpected rabbit hole that connects to this topic. Think about it, many people claim to have brief encounters with what appear to be more elegant and technically advanced human-like aliens. There are some researchers that believe uh, that certain aliens, like the Greys, uh, 
are time travelers. Perhaps this would explain how that is possible. What if they aren't aliens at all? Hmm. But I digress. This might also explain why we don't have temporal overlaps of dinosaurs. Yet another good point. When is the last time that you heard about the ghost of a T-Rex terrorizing somebody? <laughs> That is, of course, something I've never heard in a case file uh, yet. <laughs> Although maybe it is suggested that perhaps they didn't have souls like was suggested in the first half. Although, once again, I disagree with that suggestion. But if the temporal anomaly suggestion is true, then perhaps that would explain why we don't see the ghost of a Triceratops or a T-Rex roaming around the countryside. Another good question is, how could this even be possible given our current place in the universe? If you guys remember the second episode we ever did of the Dark Wolf's Den show, it was about time travel. And in that episode, I did make a point, I do believe, about one argument of why time travel would be quite almost impossible as we understand it. And that would be the location system. You would have to have a mathematical location system, unlike the normal system that we use today. And we'll explain, or I'll let Grant explain that here. Let me clarify. The Earth rotates at over a thousand miles per hour at the equator and moves around the Sun at 67,000 miles per hour. Beyond that, our Sun, and therefore our entire solar system, is whipping around the galaxy at 448,000 miles per hour. And then our galaxy itself is rocketing towards our nearest neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy, at 70 miles per second. So, if I were thinking back to a time when I was at Burger King enjoying their cheesy tots, and wanted to travel back in time to relive such a great memory, even if I went back just a couple of days, I wouldn't be a Burger King, I'd be floating somewhere in space. Not about to enjoy the tots. How then is it possible that we can have temporal anomalies like this? And again, to take the other side of the argument, if you had enough of the right coordinate and grid system and enough the information at the time, it would be very possible to land in the right spot. But it would be dangerous because you might land a thousand feet in the air, or you could land in the middle of the earth, or you could land in space. So there is definitely a huge risk to time travel given all of the factors that must be taken into account. Now, if these temporal anomalies were man-made, it would be very easy to compensate for our journey through the cosmos and not ending up in space through the use of mathematical formula and calculations. But we're talking about seemingly natural temporal anomalies. Maybe the warping of space-time caused by gravity or the Earth's magnetic field is somehow keeping these events locked locally. And that right there, I also do believe, could play a major role in a lot of this, and that is the magnetic fields between the Earth and the different solar system objects, including the sun. I've even got a theory that sunspots and solar activity may be very directly connected to the Mandela effect changes, which if it's connected to these cyclical time events, that would make a lot of sense. Now, would it? it now, with that said, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you our friend, you guys know him, you love him, ladies and gentlemen, with a story about his own childhood, I present to you, Jerry Hicks. Thank you, DW. Actually, there was a lot of activity that went on in the house that I grew up in. 
uh, to the point that my parents actually had to admit that there was something else going on. One of the first instances was when I was sitting with my dad in the living room and we had these light bulbs that screwed into the ceiling and then had the chain coming down beside it, you know, and uh, you know when you walk by those things you just slap the chain to watch it hit the ceiling back and forth and it's always something fun to do, you know. So I was sitting underneath it and we were watching a race and my dad was sitting beside me in a recliner and again I'm sitting on the floor and I laid back and I felt this cool air brush across the top of me as the best I can say it and at the same time that cord above my head straight above me went as if somebody had smacked it and whack 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 back and forth until it finally come to a stop again. I looked at my father, my father looked at me, and uh, later on he said that this was because of an earthquake that we never could verify ever happened, but you know, and it only affected that one chain, because there was two of them in the room, just the one was affected, you know, just by chance. Uh, not very logical in my opinion in his explanation, but my sister and I would also hear like uh, people calling our names. Like somebody would be calling our name from the other room or like our parents calling our name and we would open our door and say, yes, well, you know what? And they, no, we didn't say anything. Uh, uh, what? And I know I've heard it happen to my sister and I heard it happen to myself a multitude of times. Uh, we would hear footsteps through the house all the time. And yes, we had pets, but the pets would be accounted for and we would still hear very clearly somebody walking through our house and I'm sorry the settling argument just doesn't work for me I get houses settled at night but they aren't settling 24 7 I just don't buy that that's what this was was just a house settling uh, and one time I actually seen an entity that's right there was a uh, figure that I seen so my sister used to sneak into my dad's room it was a comfort thing whatever but I was gonna catch her I was, I was bound and determined I knew she was gonna do it I was gonna catch her I was gonna bust her get her in trouble so I'm laying there and I'm waiting and I'm watching in the doorway for her to move across it and I see something light colored clothed move across the doorway so I jumped up and ran out and yelled aha gotcha there was not a single person awake in the house both my sister and father were asleep and I was the only person left so who or what did I see I I just there was many times where there would be like uh you put bread on the counter and you push it back but it falls off you know just little playful things like that or you hear something on the other side of the house and just can't help but wonder you know can't quite explain what it may have been or things falling just all of a sudden when there's no reason that they should have or shaking themselves off of counters or just little weird funny things like that that would happen again not negative never negative by any means just weird you know what I mean dark wolf oh I know exactly what you mean did you ever catch any evidence of this any photographic evidence or any evidence of any type actually yes now that you mention it I uh, did I was standing with my best friend at the time and my sister's boyfriend had a camera in his hand he just picked the camera up and he, he had taken a picture a moment prior and he took a picture of me and my best friend and then took another picture of the other side of the room right after well, the picture of me and my best friend had this uh, fog over it is the only way that I can really describe it that would make any kind of sense, like a smoke across the entire picture. And nobody had a cigarette lit or anything like that. There's no reason the smoke should have been on this picture. And when I blew it up on the computer to a size that I was bigger than a digital camera screen, I could actually make out a face in this picture. But that's only the beginning. So I put this picture on my desktop computer as my background. And my computer just had consistent errors. Every time I'd go to do anything, I would have errors, memory errors, blue screen to death. Just all these different problems with the computer. And the moment that I deleted that picture, 
all the problems disappeared. Uh, I subsequently have lost that picture over time, sadly, but it's an experience that I will never forget, and I was able at one point to capture photographic evidence of an entity that I know haunted the house that I grew up in. Yes, it is too bad that you do not still have that photographic evidence. That would be very interesting indeed, especially in this day and age. But of course, now they would just say it was photoshopped, right? <laughs> you know the way people are anymore. But thank you, Jerry, very much for sharing that story with us. Uh, for uh, the house that you grew up in, that is very intriguing indeed. Was there any reason that you found that it was haunted? Like, was there people that had lived there before and been killed or anything crazy like that? No, you know, actually, DW, that's one of the stranger parts of the story because there was no, well, there was one previous owner, but they didn't die in the house. There was no death, no murder, no craziness that I know of attached to the house, which is interesting because as you were talking about earlier, uh, it could be attached to the soil, but that's more of a re replaying ghost, right? In, in that what that was like a, a residual haunting? Yes, yes, that is correct. That is a residual haunting. But this sounds more like it was an interactive haunting to me. Oh, it was very much an interactive haunting. There's no doubt about that. It constantly calling our names or even knowing our names to call clearly noted that it was an intelligent interactive haunting, whatever it was. But again, it was never mean or, you know, cause any problems. It was always fun and playful and more of just a, hey, I'm here, how you doing every now and then type thing, you know. Uh, nothing ominous or bad. Well, the fact that it was a positive entity is definitely a plus indeed. Uh, but we do thank you once again for sharing your story here this evening. Thank you everybody for listening this evening. We really appreciated you being here. Jerry, are you scared yet? Are you think you can handle the next two parts of this series? So what are you talking about in the next two parts then, DW? Well, tomorrow night we're going to talk about shadow entities and shadow people. <laughs> Have you ever seen a shadow person, Jerry? No, that's one thing I gotta say. I've never really seen a shadow entity like like they talk about, or like the Hat Man, or uh, anything like that. You gonna talk about the Hat Man tomorrow night? Well, I guess you will just have to tune in and see, won't you? And then next Wednesday, we're going to finish off this series with demons. Uh, that ought to be... Interesting indeed, don't you think, Jerry? Now, that is one thing that creeps me out, is the whole demons thing. Because I've known Exorcist, and I know that is unquestionably something that is very, very real. So, I can't really wait to hear what you're going to talk about on that. And, uh, is that going to be all of your ghost mini-series you got going on? Yes, yes, it will be all for now. <laughs> Maybe I'll have to take over the show sometime and lock you in a closet. Uh, I'm sorry, what, DW? Uh, uh, I, I said this show's getting kind of long, so we should probably close it. That, that, that's what I said. Huh. I swore I heard something else, but anyway, ladies and gentlemen, this has been another episode of the Dark Wolf's Dinge. Hey, what are you doing? That's my line. Oh yeah, sorry DW, got carried away. So what do you guys at home think? Uh, do you think there are multiple kinds of ghosts in haunting situations? Uh, do you think these could be caused, perhaps, by a time loop situation of some type? <laughs> that is definitely something I didn't see coming this episode. That threw me for a little bit of a loop too. <laughs> or could it all just be down to hearing vibrations and crazy things going on in our heads? In the end, ladies and gentlemen, 
You be the judge. We got to close it out. That's right. That's it for this episode of the Dark Wall Stin Show for Spooktober 21st, 2020. <laughs> I hope everybody has enjoyed this episode on ghost and hauntings. Whether you're on the edge of reality, the edge of the galaxy, or the edge of your seat, we're glad you chose us to be right there with you. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the weekend fun has now been kicked off the right way. That's right. And tomorrow night, we will be back on the air with an all-new episode with part two of the Ghost series where we discuss shadow people. That's right. This is actually a suggested topic from Miss Earth Daughter, so thank you, Earth Daughter, as that will now be a part of our mini-series. And then when the den closes on Thursday, well, that's when the weekend fun has only just begun. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure you come back every Friday through Sunday for AJ the Rippin' Rabbit's Rippin' Rabbit Hole live show. That's right. This week I happen to know that he's going to be talking on Friday night about Halloween costumes. Uh, what were you as a kid? What was your favorite costume, right? I always used to dress up as a soldier because my dad was in the army. <laughs> Among other things, of course. And then on Saturday, AJ's going to be discussing seances. Have you ever been a part of a seance? You know, where they summon spirits into the room? A lot of them were uh, recognized as fakes in the 20s and 30s, but there are those that have been very, very real. <laughs> then on Sunday, AJ's going to be talking about the fear of dolls. You gotta admit, some of these dolls are pretty darn creepy, right? I know I've seen some that really kind of spook me out a lot. Uh, then you got dolls like Annabelle, right? They cause all kinds of problems in the world. All this and more coming up this weekend on the Rippin' Rabbit Hole live show with our buddy AJ the Rippin' Rabbit. Uh, then next Wednesday, we're going to finish out our ghost series talking about demons. That's right. Uh, one place I go that helps me deal with my demons uh, is a place called the Rippin' Rabbit Hole.com. That's right. <laughs> That is R I P O N R A W B I T H O L E dot com. That's right, over there you're going to find a lot of good fun stuff. Like in the bottom of every single page, there's a great big red button that says record. <laughs> Hit that button and you can record us 30 seconds of audio that we'll put on the radio for you. That's right. Just like the beginning of this episode where you heard Cynthia Sue Larson and propagate this light. Uh, we'll gladly get you on the air also. So, <laughs> or if you don't want to get on the air, perhaps you would like to come and chat with the Rippin' Rabbits after the show. I'm going to go back there to my favorite hangout right after this show, and that is the 24-7 Backstage Lounge. That's right. Over at the RippinRabbitHole.com, just select that 24-7 Backstage Lounge. You're going to have to scroll about halfway down the page and select the V. IP entrance. Uh, in there, you're going to select the microphone and camera, but you can turn those off the moment that you get inside. <laughs> we do hope to see you over there. Because for you guys here, the conversation is ending. But for the Rippin' Rabbits, the conversation has just begun. Uh, I hope everybody uh, has enjoyed this weekend kickoff show. And we will see you all tomorrow night. 
And on behalf of AJ the Rippin' Rabbit, everybody at Rippin' Common Sense Radio, and on behalf of Chick Mandela Effect, Michael Musco, Walt House, and everybody who has contributed to this show, we thank you for being here. And remember, until next time, stay awake, but dare to dream. Good night, everybody. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. The Animals of Radio kicks off the weekend right for you. Give yourselves a round of applause for being smart enough to be here. If you enjoyed tonight's look at Jerry Hicks in the Dark Wolf's Den as he howled at ghosts in part one, please make sure to thumb up that video. Hit that subscribe button and ring that bell. You'll get our notifications every time we go live. We're here every Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights, bringing you the very best of Common Sense Radio, the Rip and Rabbit Hole. Jerry's going to return tomorrow night for part two. Thursday, October 22nd, starting at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10, 9 Central. Join Jerry for the two-parter series on Ghosts and Shadow people (laughs) as spooktober rolls through the rabbit hole i'll be back again friday night with a look at halloween costumes we're going to look at some of the greatest halloween costumes ever and some of the hottest trends for what you could be this year join me friday night as we explore halloween costumes together a fun episode of spooktober not all of them have to be creepy and scary but here's the deal do you have a photo of a costume that you're proud of that you've done in the last 20 or 30 years if so please email it to me at rip and rabbit hole at gmail.com that's r-i-p-o-n-r-a-b-b-i-t-h-o-l-e at gmail.com i want to see your costumes I've got a few that I've done over the years. I'll be sharing with you Friday night, uh, but I want to see yours, and I'll include it on air as we look through the rabbit hole of Halloween costumes. Then Saturday night, join me for a special on-air experiment with a seance. I think this may perhaps be the first on-air seance experiment ever conducted live on radio. So be here or be square Saturday night, starting at 7 p.m. Pacific, 10, 9 Central, as we take on the spirits in an on-air seance. It's going to be wild. Then we'll end out the weekend together, right, Sunday, with an audience-suggested topic, the fear of dolls. Now, this came up on our Fear of Clowns episode earlier in Spooktober, and I got to say, I'm frightened just thinking about the topic. That's a look at the weekend ahead right here on the very best of Common Sense Radio, The Rippin' Rabbit Hole. I'm AJ, The Rippin' Rabbit. On behalf of Jerry Hicks and the Dark Wolf's Den, take care of yourselves and each other. Good night. With a Spaniard who had left his wife behind. Are you ready for the ultimate Halloween experience? (laughs) This year, with all the social distancing taking place, Halloween, contrary to popular belief, has not been canceled. I repeat, Halloween has not been canceled. (laughs) The Rippin' Rabbit Hole is proud to sponsor a unique virtual Halloween event taking place October 15th through the 31st exclusively at rtrickortreat.com That's O-U-R trick or treat dot com Sign up and knock on virtual doors for 17 days straight to win a variety of prizes from national, state, and local sponsors. 
Check out our trickortreat.com for the ultimate Halloween experience this year. Illusion. I'm lost in a wonderland of confusion. 